I'm now really delighted to uh, welcome you all to our public event, uh, which is taking place today with um, our special guest, Madam Prime Minister uh, of the Republic of Moldova, um, who we can see on the right screen, if I see the right way. Madam Prime Minister, we are sitting here and you are uh, screened behind us, so it's a bit uh, strange situation. I try to look at you and I put the, my back to the rest of the auditorium. We will see how this works out. And I think on my left hand side, we have the European Commission, um, uh, the representative of, European Com uh, of the European Union, sorry, um, in, um, in Chisinau, uh, Mr. Mazaks, welcome you as well. It's great to have you here, like uh, the two guts for Mr. Lüttenberg and me uh, behind and in front of us. And yeah, I'm also delighted to have. Matthias Lüttenberg here, an old colleague from, yeah, uh, let's say the Central Europe connection in Berlin, uh, who was uh, for a long time um, one driving part of uh, Chancellor Merkel's policy in the region. And now he's back in his uh, old house, the foreign ministry and the director for uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And um, yeah, so um, let's uh, um, have a start. And uh, perhaps, uh, Madam Prime Minister, as for us, it's the greatest honor, of course, having you today here. Um, screened uh, to us to Berlin. Um, I will just hand over to you for some introductionary remarks. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be invited to speak at the, the international workshop, which is dedicated uh, to my country, the Republic of Moldova. Uh, and I really hope to have the opportunity uh, to see many of you both in Chisinau and in Berlin. I want to first thank uh, the South, Southeast Europe Association for organizing this workshop and uh, giving a platform for our government to present its agenda and the challenges we face uh, since we came to power in August. Uh, you have heard and will hear from my colleagues and you will see uh, what a strong team we have um, uh, in, in, in this government. I'm very proud of my colleagues. Uh, as you know, in July, the Party of Action and Solidarity uh, won a historical landslide victory in the parliamentary elections on a very strong mandate for anti-corruption, good governance and economic development. And for the first time in 12 years, the parliament, the presidency, and the government are all aligned and steering the country in the same direction, uh, one that reflects the will of an overwhelming majority of the Moldovan people. And it is for the first time in history uh, that this one direction is actually a direction of European integration and uh, value-based economic development. Our reform agenda is bold, ambitious, and urgent. Uh, we have full support of our people, and we are very grateful to have the support of international partners. Under the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union, we already have a clear agenda for the next four years, and we are fully committed to adopt and implement all the necessary provisions to modernize our country based on best European examples. Uh, so I will speak a little bit about uh, our agenda or our government program in several key areas um, and give you just some examples of the things that we have managed to do so far. And then I will conclude sort of a, with a more strategic analysis and then um, be open to any questions that uh, may arise from the participants. But if we talk about rule of law and justice reform, um, of course, uh, you know, it is uh, the, probably the most important priority for this government's reform agenda uh, to carry out uh, justice sector reform, uh, which for us involves uh, an external vetting of judges and prosecutors. Um, the systems have not been able to uh, reform from within, despite several years of um, uh, ref reforms based on um, best European examples. And uh, we think that now we can only progress with this external vetting. This is crucial uh, for our citizens, uh, but it's also key to consolidate 
uh, our institutions and make them more responsive, efficient, and accountable. But importantly, you know, reforming the judiciary, ensuring the rule of law uh, is not a pr just a prerequis prerequisite for a functioning democracy, but it is also uh, a prerequisite for economic development, for an economic environment based on fair competition and predictability. Uh, it is important to mention that in this important reform, we count on our partners, in particular, the Council of Europe, and I was um, uh, very happy to welcome um, uh, Mrs. Buric yesterday here, uh, also the Venice Commission and the EU uh, in supporting us and helping us implement the best standards. The, the recommendations and expertise of these institutions are paramount to ensure uh, that we do this right and that the reform of the judiciary will be sustainable in the long term. We uh, are doing uh, our utmost to tackle corruption and punish high-level corruptions that dominated our politics and public administration in the past. So beyond the um, judicial reform, you know, good governance and improving uh, the administration in the pub in in sort of public institutions uh, is also an important uh, element uh, to to our. Um, uh, good governance agenda. So from the first day in power, my government adopted a zero tolerance to corruption. Um, and while it is up to the judiciary to hold those responsible for corruption uh, to account, it is our responsibility and priority uh, to create a more open, transparent, and fairer uh, government administration. Um, we uh, have already done several controls where we stopped uh, acquisitions that were done with violations or were marred by corruption. Uh, we have also stopped several um, intermediary contracts in uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, and we have cleaned up uh, the, uh, the leadership uh, in uh, main public administration bodies. I will talk about uh, some of the people we were able to attract uh, later on, but uh, th this is sort of our uh, consistent challenge to uh, bring people with the right values and uh, the right professional um, background. Uh, we want to dismantle the collusion of private and political interests that have kept the country captive to the interests of the few uh, at the expense of the many. Uh, so, you know, we have this, uh, many of these arrangements uh, like uh, public-private partnerships, and I call them public expenditure, private gain. That's, that's the approach that used to be, be in the past. And what we want to do is we want to replace informal governance with good governance and re replace informal institutions with strong and resilient, accountable institutions. Um, we uh, place professional ethics and integrity at the heart of our approach towards public administration. Um, and only in this manner, we can build trust in Moldova as a destination for business and investments. And I am sure that these efforts uh, will pay off. If we talk about improving the economy, you know, it's not just about fighting the past, it's building a better future. Uh, so uh, for us, um, uh, 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 an important objective is to improve the economic situation of the country and uh, create the favorable circumstances for the country to be uh, more resilient and to improve the competitiveness of our products on markets, to facilitate the open opening of new businesses and gear the national economy towards sectors with high growth potential. Um, my vision is that the state should be a partner of the private sector and engage with representatives of honest and legitimate businesses. Um, as I said, you know, unfortunately, these vested interests exist in the, in the private sector as well. Um, uh, and, and there is a distortion in some areas of the competitive environment. And we are working intensely uh, to ensure a clear, transparent, and business-friendly legal and regulatory framework. Uh, some of this is in the form of my colleagues in Parliament, um, uh, you know, holding to account uh, regulatory institutions, and some of this is uh, uh, up to the government in terms of improving the regulatory environment. Um, uh, and it is, uh, 
it is paramount for us to combat this market abuse practices um, and uh, uh, you know eliminate barriers uh, to entry and exit from the market um, and eliminate abuses of dominant position or violation of principles of fair competition. Um, it is important to improve the business environment and to create incentives uh, uh, for uh, small and medium companies, which in our view should become the backbone of um, the Moldovan economy. So in our government program, we have ambitious reforms on so dereg deregulation, access to financial instruments, access to, to advisory services, and investment in the growth of enterprises, which ultimately is key to creating jobs. Um, Another important uh, aspect in uh, our um, reviving of the economy is digitalization. And we see digitalization as an important um, process for both uh, our public services and for our economy. Uh, the the COVID-19 pandemic has given the necessary impetus uh, and it made policymakers realize the importance of accelerating the process of the digital transformation of our country. Um, and you will hear a lot more about this from the deputy prime minister uh, in the future sessions. But um, you know, for, I just wanted to mention that this this is for the first time that uh, we have a deputy prime minister res responsible exclusively for digitalization, um, and uh, this has already uh, given quite important results. Uh, and the parliament uh, already voted in uh, uh, final reading several weeks ago, a package of several laws on digitalization following the government's proposal. Uh, these changes ensure that entrepreneurs are able to register their business online without physical pr process, uh, uh, only by using a qualified electronic signature. Uh, we also, through these uh, changes, ensure that the EU e-signatures will be recognized in Moldova which will allow ease of interaction with state authorities online. Uh, the creation of one single shop for certain services delivered to uh, citizens and to businesses in their interaction with public authorities and canceling the burdensome need of asking for different paper-based documents which hinder business development. And um, I assure you that we have only started and you know we see a vision where digital solutions are uh, the norm and the default solution rather than the exception. Um, you know, the, we, we are a pro-business government. We encourage investments. So, uh, you know, we have an important um, process for attracting uh, foreign investors to the country. Um, and, uh, and we encourage more business opening and creating jobs, but also the, for, in terms of foreign investment, this has important effects on productivity and know-how. Yet uh, also let me highlight that there are two key words in the name of our party. It's action and solidarity. And it is our firm intention to not only enhance the business environment, but also to help employees, um, especially now that they are affected by the current double crisis of energy and public health. Um, that is why for the first time uh, since the pandemic began, you know, unfortunately with a huge delay, but uh, it, it fell to my government to uh, adopt a package to support businesses uh, that were impacted by COVID-19 protection measures um, and uh, in the form of furlough schemes, this support for affected workers and um, uh, you know, schemes that have proven effective all across Europe, um, uh, such as the Kutzarbeit uh, scheme in Germany. Um, we also took steps to uh, support parents who have to stay at home in case schools have to be closed due to the coronavirus uh, infection. And we have also adopted incentives for vaccination and compensation to businesses for extra days of uh, vacation. Um, and in order to offset the effects of the rising energy prices, um, uh, we are putting in place uh, a large package to protect the most vulnerable groups. Um, so first, we are increasing the targeted social assistance, um, the so-called aid for the winter period, for a total of 300,000 households, 
and we are offering uh, compensation for the first uh, volumes uh, of gas consumed uh, for increased uh, to compensate for the increased gas and heating bills. Um, earlier, uh, I was saying that we used the COVID crisis as a chance to enhance digitalization, uh, and it is also our intention to use the energy crisis as an impetus to accelerate our path towards a green economy, towards better energy efficiency. Um, we, we intend to work on the energy efficiency of public buildings in partnership with EBRD and EIB over the coming years. We uh, have financing and plans to improve our waste management system, uh, but also uh, we will uh, work very hard on energy security and ensuring uh, that we are always uh, prepared and are not caught off guard by uh, future crises. Um, the transition towards the green economy is especially necessary given the fact that Moldova is vulnerable to climate change, also due to the high proportion of the workforce involved in agriculture. Now, if we talk about changing the culture, the country, uh, I, you know, I want to mention the importance of the uh, diaspora. You know, besides the energy and public health crises which has hit us recently, our country is facing a more profound crisis, a demographic crisis. Uh, we have over a million talented, skilled, and hardworking people who saw no future for themselves in their own country and are now contributed to the advancement of other countries, including in Germany. Um, you know, before the elections, I actually went to campaign in the diaspora in Germany and have met many of these people um, in uh, uh, German cities. Uh, convincing them to return will be hard, um, but we are working on having programs to help them join our efforts to modernize the country um, and um, to become true agents of change at home. Um, so uh, we already have ministers from the diaspora that have, have joined my government, uh, giving up prestigious and well-paid position, uh, positions in order to help Moldova on its path uh, of reforms. We have several heads of state authorities that have come from the diaspora, and some of my advisors uh, I have also been able to convince to return from diaspora. But uh, there are also people who can help while being um, uh, abroad. So for example, uh, we have uh, initiated a program to bring members of the diaspora on the boards of state-owned enterprises and bring a new good governance uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, corporate governance of state-owned enterprises. Um, and together uh, with uh, uh, our partners, uh, and in particular with Germany, uh, we uh, will be working on hiring uh, consultants, experts uh, from the diaspora, uh, civil servants, and in order to help the, bring, you know, innovation, know-how, and best practices, uh, and, and uh, importantly, new attitudes. Just a couple of words on foreign policy. Um, you know, we uh, regard an active, consistent, pragmatic, and skillful foreign policy as essential in order to implement our vision for transforming uh, the Republic of Moldova into a modern democratic state based on European values. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the outset of my intervention, we view stronger ties with the EU, including the implementation of the association agreement with the EU and the DCFTA, as a guarantee to modernize our state and our society and to raise uh, living standards. Uh, we have a strong mandate, uh, even though we have one on an internal uh, mandate of uh, fighting corruption, uh, reforming the judiciary, improving the good governance. This is actually a European type of development. So we have um, a, a very strong political mandate to push for European integration. Um, I would also like to um, highlight the importance of the support that has been provided uh, by our uh, Western partners in the fight against uh, coronavirus and in dealing with the energy crisis. This has actually 
brought um, uh, quite a, a lot of goodwill. So I will just give you one example. A lot of uh, Moldovan citizens were welcome to go to Romania and uh, get vaccinated even before vaccines were available in Moldova. And uh, this has been very much appreciated uh, by the public. And the constant engagement of our partners in helping us access vaccines and helping us improve our equipment in helping us provide services to our citizens um, uh, again has has uh, uh, been very much appreciated uh, by the by the people um, more more recently you know um, we have uh, faced quite a difficult energy crisis and uh, the importance of the support uh, provided by the EU um, in this uh, uh, in this sense, both in terms of expertise, um, uh, you know, public and political support uh, has been um, extraordinary. Uh, another priority area of our foreign policy is actually related to our direct neighbors, Romania and Ukraine, with whom we have a um, very good dialogue and uh, who have also been extremely uh, engaged and supportive uh, of our government. Uh, even today, uh, uh, our foreign minister, Deputy Prime Minister Popescu, and uh, uh, the Minister of Education were in uh, Bucharest together with President Sandu uh, to sign some important commitments and roadmaps um, in terms of our cooperation uh, and, and we've, with Romania. And we very much look forward to uh, the resolution of the political crisis in Romania to uh, push that agenda with even more acceleration forward. Uh, we also count on strong ties with the uh, United States of America. Uh, American support has been crucial for in our development in several fields, ranging from promotion of local governance to the provision of COVID relief, um, cooperation on digitalization, and support aimed at increasing the competitiveness of private enterprises. When it comes to Russia, our government wants a pragmatic mutually beneficial and stable relationship. There are plenty of issues on our bilateral relations, starting with the Transnistrian region, um, the commitment of our government for European integration, our commercial exchanges, uh, and mainly uh, the restrictions to, on access of our exporters to the Russian market. Um, in the next four years, we have to, we, we count on making important progress in bilateral relations. Um, and uh, I also want to stress that we want to um, move the policies of our government not to be dictated only by geopolitical consideration, by, by the need oh to help our people and support the Moldovan businesses. Um, and finally, uh, in terms of supporting Moldovan businesses, um, you know, we really uh, strive to strengthen the economic component of our diplomacy. We want our embassies to be much more active in attracting foreign investments, promoting Moldovan domestic products abroad, and expanding our network of commercial and economic ties. Um, I know I've talked for a long time, so let me actually conclude uh, by saying that, you know, this government has only uh, been in office for a bit more than three months. Um, during this time, we have had to deal with a new pandemic wave with, and with a gas crisis. So um, we have demonstrated that in addition to handling this crisis, we can actually move forward slowly but surely towards the agenda that we have promised uh, to people uh, during the elections. Um, and this is an agenda of uh, improving good governance and uh, reforming corruption and creating um, a sound uh, economic environment. We uh, very much hope that in four years, uh, the, the main result that uh, we achieve is actually, you know, a different equilibrium on the working of institutions, um, you know, a much more uh, professional states, a much more professional uh, and integral justice system, and, and importantly, the trust of our citizens in the future of Moldova, the trust of our citizens in, in, in the government and in institutions, 
And then of course, you know, the social capital and the trust of people in each other. So thank you very much. And um, uh, I know I have uh, talked a lot. It's a broad agenda and, uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Excellency. Um, in the opening remarks, I said that to a certain extent, um, Moldova's electorate gave a second chance, uh, comeback possibility also for the European Union, not only in Moldova, but also in the Eastern Partnership. And I think that the success of the government program with its values, especially, is really important, not only for Moldova, not only uh, for your neighbors, but also for European Union strategic aims in the region. So it's not only about Moldova. Uh, so I think it's important that you have a broad agenda, uh, although when it's, of course, necessary to uh, talk a bit longer then. But I would like to hand over to the other side of Fizi now, um, Mr. Mazaik. So uh, we heard about this uh, ambitious um, 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 task and program of the new government. Could you perhaps answer on two questions? On the one hand, the prime minister said that already a lack of personnel is relevant. So they're trying to get people back from the diaspora. They're trying to also change personnel. They need good educated people who are willing to be not corrupted and to invest their personal uh, engagement into change in the country. What is your view on, on the state of art of public institutions in Moldova? How can we as the European Union, but also perhaps as Germany, support the path of this country uh, due to this point. And the second point is, if uh, you're talking to your colleagues in Kisinau, what is usually the most um, wanted, the most um, um, uh, needed uh, demand from uh, the European Union? What should we do first uh, in favor of supporting the change in the country? Thank you for those questions. And uh, well, I doubt that uh, I'm very glad to listen to the Madam Prime Minister, because it's rather seldom that we could, with a, with a country, basically share our speaking points on uh, much of the statements, because uh, our views overlap on uh, so many questions. So if I look at the very big picture, I would say that Moldova, Republic of Moldova has achieved democratic change. Now it needs to achieve democratic transformation. And uh, from that uh, flows all the other strands of uh, the support that Moldova would need and uh, the EU and Germany can uh, provide. Indeed, the uh, issue of the personnel is a rather painful one, I think, at this stage. Uh, and I see Madam Prime Minister nodding in agreement because uh, there are both objective and subjective uh, problems for that, ranging from low salaries to corrupt practices in the past. And this indeed may be one of the biggest challenges for the government's plans uh, to implement those plans, uh, because it can't end just with the diaspora ministers or heads of agencies, but it needs to uh, be implemented at much lower working levels. So uh, there are things that we can already do as a European Union. For instance, we have a number of high-level advisors who are pro providing strategic advice uh, to the government, to the ministers on different uh, subjects that uh, the Moldovan government has asked us to provide. And we also have offered uh, short-term advice. Uh, we also have a number of uh, shorter-term advisors on uh, particular areas. And uh, we can also have uh, ad hoc needs uh, helped uh, when the need be. For instance, uh, the energy crisis was one very good example of that, where the European, yeah, you, the experts provided by the European Union were able to support the Moldovan government and uh, uh, help it get to a reasonably acceptable result imperfect result at that, uh, but uh, a solution which has allowed the Republic of Moldova to have 
uh, gas at uh, rather low price. Uh, so what we can do on top of that, this is something that we are in discussions with the government. Perhaps we can find uh, some more ways of supporting uh, the new government with uh, human resources, but that is uh, for the future discussions. Uh, if you ask me the, the second question on the most asked uh, support, I am not sure that we would be able to identify one. Uh, but perhaps there are three strands that have been uh, key. One is uh, financial support, because this indeed has been a uh, very important uh, support for the uh, Republic of Moldova, uh, be it on the microfinancial assistance or be it budget support. We have managed also to do it on a uh, short notice, in fact, a very short notice, because uh, Madam Prime Minister mentioned the uh, vulnerable groups of population that will be affected by the rising gas tariffs and uh, following uh, the promise of uh, Ursula von der Leyen the EU has committed to provide 60 million euros uh, as budget support uh, exactly to help alleviate the situation of those vulnerable uh, groups of uh, population. Uh, and of course, we will be also working in the future on uh, the next stages of microfinancial assistance as well. Uh, the second block uh, which I would like to mention is uh, the expertise, and that expertise is partly related to uh, the first one because quite often uh, the implementation of projects also means uh, having the European expertise uh, that is transmitted to uh, the Republic of uh, Moldova and perhaps one area where I would highlight this for the future is that an area where we have been working already quite a lot in the past, uh, where it was even clearer now in this autumn how important it is and that's energy security that uh, Madam Prime Minister also mentioned. So this is also one of the areas that we will definitely be continuing our cooperation in the future, uh, so on very practical level, uh, but also on expertise level. And a uh, third element, uh, which perhaps should have been mentioned as a first one, but that's the political support. Uh, because uh, you can have money, uh, you can have expertise, but uh, without this component of political support, uh, this may prove insufficient. So I hope that the support that the European Union has uh, provided, be it the top officials of the EU or the member state support of the Republic of Moldova has been very visible lately. The very significant increase in the number of visits that have been going both to Brussels, to the European capitals and from the European capitals. I think this is also the way how we can uh, send the message to the Moldovan population that uh, the country is on the right path and that uh, the European Union is there to support the Republic of Moldova on this path. Uh, Mr. Lüttenberg, we know each other so well, so um, I know that you are a great diplomat and even mean answers you can smoothly answer. So I would like to pose a bit of mean answer to you. We talked about resources and the Prime Minister already said about the situation with the gas prices in the country. Is it in a certain extent a problem for a reform country, for a reform government uh, to on the one hand stick to European Union values, but on the other hand, being to a certain extent depending on Gazprom <laughs> deals. And what can we from Germany do against it? I mean, we have now this new pipeline built and uh, the Russians would do what we want because we want this pipeline so much, I thought. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister. Th thank you very much for, for having me. Indeed, a nasty question. It has nothing to do with Nord Stream 2, I'm sure. So I can focus only on the uh, on, on Moldova. When I had the chance to visit Kishinau almost exactly a month ago, 
uh, I arrived in the middle of the gas crisis and everybody was was really nervous and it's thanks to um, a number of factors that we somehow managed to mitigate with the EU um, first and foremost and then the 60 million um, euros which were made available. On the other side, of course, the problem goes a lot deeper than just a, a spike in, in gas prices and the dependence that, that Moldova experiences um, certainly is a weakness and in the, the, the having to rely on spot market prices is certainly not the best recipe. Therefore, I was very happy to see that a long-term contract was finally agreed on. And um, I, I hope that the conditions of, of this contract will allow Moldova to, uh, on the one side, to provide for a substantial amount of, of gas for its uh, population, but at the same time, use this um, experience and use the, the, the time ahead, as the Prime Minister has already rightly said, to reform not only the country but also the energy sector in a way that green energy will play a larger role in the future. I think this is certainly a wake-up moment also for, for the people in, in Moldova that for a long time it has been taken for granted that the gas will flow from Moscow and that the prices were more or less um, okay with 250 uh, US dollars. Um, this was certainly um, nothing one, one would argue about. But the problem here again goes a lot deeper because the, the interrelation between Transnistria and, 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 and Moldova in terms of gas flows and energy mm -hmm. flows um, certainly constitutes a problem there. Indeed, we do have this um, the new interconnector from Romania, but it will not be sufficient to, to um, provide for energy for all of, of Moldova. So we need additional um, sources. And I think here, renewable energy might play a major role in the future. And it's, it's our... Um, at least our, our wish that, that Moldova would, with the help of international financial institutions, with the help of the German Development Corporation, will, will walk this, this extra mile and, and invest in renewables and to, to decrease the dependence of, on fossil energy, just as we're doing in Germany. Mm. So if I may stick to one point, um, we have this current development regarding the prices to be paid for the last and the next months in advance. Uh, within 48 hours, which is, um, I mean, if you make contracts with Gazprom, sometimes um, the contracts are different readings uh, underlying. Do you see any chance that Germany would um, use its leverage towards Gazprom um, to influence them in favor of uh, being a bit more nice or more exact to the reading of the contracts? Or are we so much um, busy with our own Nord Stream point, which has nothing to do with Moldova, of course? Well, well, first of all, I have to admit, I don't know the contract and its precise wording, so I don't know what has been agreed when the 790 US dollars were agreed and what were exactly the conditions of repayment. I do understand, though, that everything seems to, to go into the right direction, that the money will be made available and that the bill will be paid. I sincerely hope that Gazprom and Moldova gas will not make it a huge issue if it's 48 hours later. I don't see that, that Gazprom will actually uh, stop delivering gas, at least I hope so. Um, if Germany will use its leverage, it depends, of course, on uh, if Moldova asks us to do so and then and talk to, to anybody. But um, as you rightly said, um, these contracts are contracts between two sides and then we are not part of this contract. So I, I guess this is in the first place something between Moldova and Gazprom. Moldova Gas, as, as you know, is largely um, um, pertaining to, to Gazprom as well. Mm -hmm. Madam Prime Minister, I would hand over this point to you just for a moment. I don't want to stick too deep on the gas issue, but I think it's a quite a hot topic and um, we don't want to mandle too much around. Um, I think for your government, it was a success to sign a deal, although we all know that signing deals with Gazprom in such a dependent situation usually is not an obvious success because you had not the perfect bargain situation. What is the situation now for your government regarding this new task given from Moscow? Uh, what is your claim? What is your strategy? Uh, how to overcome this? And what is, from your view, could be helpful as a reaction from Berlin, from Brussels? Um, yeah, just to give you the open floor on the topic. Um, thank you. So, indeed, um, I think with the help of our partners, um, we managed to uh, drastically improve our negotiating position in October. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, important uh, steps we took is we actually managed to um, find the resources to staff uh, or to find the people uh, and staff a state-owned enterprise 
and to actually buy for the first time in Moldova's history, gas on the spot market. I think this was a very important symbolic uh, achievement. Uh, you know, even if everybody understood that uh, at such high prices, which were basically 10 times higher than what was included in the tariff at the time uh, we bought this uh, uh, gas on the spot market, but at least, you know, we, we could buy some time, which was very, very important. Um, now, at the same time, yeah, indeed, we have reached um, a contract uh, with uh, Gazprom uh, at a price that is currently, you know, uh, low, twice lower than the market price. It's still, uh, you know, two and a half times higher than the previous tariff. Uh, so this is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, you know, people don't see this uh, necessarily, you know, even if you can tell them uh, about uh, world prices, but really, you know, the, what they see is that their tariff has increased by two and a half times. Um, so, so it's very important to have the support uh, of the EU and uh, the financial uh, and the fiscal position to be able to provide some compensation. Now, we have, um, uh, you, you know, we had a sort of gentleman's agreement about October uh, prices uh, and, and, and how we would pay. And, uh, you know, we just needed a little bit more time to and, and some flexibility to find uh, the proper legal, um, you know, acceptable uh, solution uh, to provide uh, this uh, uh, so sort of this uh, um, cash flow to Moldova Gas uh, to pay for the uh, gas uh, uh, accessed in October. Uh, and we think we found the solution uh, uh, through a session of debt, uh, which uh, both uh, sort of uh, helps uh, provide the, the, the flow of money to Moldova Gas, but also gives us more control over one of our state-owned enterprises' debt in the energy sector. Uh, so we hope that um, Gazprom will be understanding that this takes, you know, a little bit more than 48 hours, uh, as uh, um, Matthias already mentioned. So, uh, you know, we will be uh, basically engaging in a, a pragmatic and constructive dialogue to make sure that gas is not stopped and this issue is resolved. Um, at the same time, you know, this shows again that, you know, we need to have uh, a longer term strategy. We need to be prepared. I completely uh, agree that this is an opportunity to invest in renewables. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity to uh, change the structure of our um, energy market. Also, it's a great opportunity, you know, to 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 ramp up <laughs> uh, our um, economy. And uh, you know, we are actually a very energy poor country. You know, most of the on the right bank of Moldova, uh, you, you know, most of the consumers are households. So, you know, we need to ensure that we create the proper conditions for, uh, for industry, for, you know, economic development, and, um, you know, ensure that we put this, uh, both these volumes and the possibility to access alternative markets to good use. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I would perhaps hand this over to Mr. Mazax and try to give you the, uh, the task to uh, also leave this topic by a concluding remark and then leading to the next. I mean, with your personal background, you know quite well how is it for a small country being um, having to rely on Russian energy supply to a certain extent and also how to get rid of it. As well, today on the conference, we heard that one of the main topics is the vetting and the, yeah, the justice reform, the vetting of judges and prosecution and the reform agenda in democracy, rule of law and transparency science. Do you think that the Russian side could have an interest trying to use the gas problem to put more hindrance for this positive agenda of the government? And what do you think can be done to not let these tactics be successful? Thank you. Perhaps I can start with the last part of the question. Uh, if one looks at policy, I think this is not about uh, countering something, but in a better situation, creating circumstances when uh, these negative developments can't take place. In other words, that there is 
less potential for hindrance that you referred to, be it any external actor that uh, there may be. Uh, yes, indeed, if I look at our national experience, and I come from Latvia, uh, where I have been a career diplomat, then uh, indeed uh, the path to listening dependence on a single source is rather obviously creating other sources of access and already the interconnection with Romania in uh, for Republic of Moldova is very good news in itself because this does create uh, new avenues uh, for work but uh, this gets me in to the point that uh, it is very important, and we have been uh, mentioning that, that uh, for the long-term interests of the Republic of Moldova, it is important to implement the third energy package, because not because it would be directed against someone, but because uh, this uh, just creates better opportunities for the country. To give an example from our region, the Lithuanian companies created uh, an LNG terminal in Lithuania. The next month, uh, the prices that uh, Gazprom was offering both for Lithuania and for Latvia, which are interconnected markets, fell by 30%. So it doesn't mean that you don't want to rely on this or that source, but the moment that you have alternative sources, uh, you have more leverage also with other providers. Uh, so this is one direction that I would uh, see as very important. And second, uh, a reminder that uh, the best energy is the energy that you don't spend. So whatever measures that can be taken to create the energy, uh, to lessen the energy consumption, for instance, by insulating the buildings, which is one of the priority areas, both for governments, uh, for the government and for the European Union. This means that uh, there will be less energy consumption, irrespective of the source. So, Madam Prime Minister, uh, when I'm looking um, on the Instagram account of your president, I'm seeing that she is quite along uh, in the country, hiking with people, visiting schools, singing contests. Um, yeah, a bit like a Germany in the campaign. Uh, the MP, Mr. Abraham from the Conservatives is in the hall. He's coming from a region in Germany where perhaps always a liquor is always in the hand also in the photos. Um, so this reminded me a bit to yeah, like how politics is working here. On the other hand, when we were talking today here about the main task, vetting justice reform, I think in Germany, nobody would elect Mr. Abraham because he says I'm organizing a justice reform in Germany. Yeah. So what is your thing, how to promote, how to explain this transformation of the country uh, to the people on the ground um, by hiking or uh, singing? Uh, you know, um, hiking and singing was an important way to make a connection uh, with people and to, uh, uh, you know, explain to them why it is that um, a reformed judiciary is so important for Moldova. You know, this is, uh, uh, unfortunately, I mean, corruption has gotten to a point uh, where uh, people have started to understand, uh, it has started to affect them uh, individually. You know, uh, they understand that in the absence of a uh, working and effective judiciary, uh, you know, we will be paying for the banking fraud for decades to come. Um, and, you know, they know who the banking who the banking fraud perpetrators were seven years ago uh, yet um, uh, you know they know that these people have not been punished and um, uh, of course you know this is this is uh, making uh, uh, people quite uh, uh, angry and anxious so so uh, in a sense I you know I would Congratulate Germany on the fact that it has reached a point where you know nobody would win an election on justice reform. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I I do want to get to the point where you know Moldova doesn't have to uh, win elections on an anti-corruption and uh, you know justice reform agenda because 
uh, you know, we would reach a better equilibrium and then only concentrate on, um, uh, you know, e economic policies and, and what economic policies are more effective than others. At the same time, I do want to say that, you know, we have, um, you know, we, ha we have not only um, uh, come up with this agenda, we have a very uh, developed, I would say, governance program. You know, we promised a very significant increase in minimum pensions, and we have done that in our first uh, month in office. You know, we have raised minimum pension uh, from uh, 55 euros to 100 euros for about, uh, uh, on average, uh, for about, uh, you know, 200,000 people. And then, you know, we have made increases on uh, sort of payments to people with disabilities and so on. Um, you know, we have come up with a very ambitious agenda on investing in infrastructure. You know, we have promised specific projects. Um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, rebuilding roads, uh, providing water and sewage, um, implementing small um, uh, projects in localities. So, so, so the, the anti-corruption and justice agenda really made us more credible uh, also in implementing uh, our economic and social agenda. Mr. Lüttenberg, the last question to you before I open up uh, to the auditorium. Um, what is your assumption if you look at the Eastern Partnership, perhaps also as the region South East Europe, because we are still with the South East Europe Association. Um, what is the um, importance of the question of Moldova as showing a role model uh, that transformation can work out now? I mean, we have the candidate status of countries on the Western Balkans, we have Turkey, we have the DCFDA countries in the Eastern Partnership. Where would you locate Moldova in this? Is it more like Ukraine or more like Georgia or more like <laughs> Armenia or more like Serbia? Um, what is what is the role of Moldova in this, in the, in this concept mm -hmm. in our neighborhood? Perhaps the country which is uh, without rights, sometimes forgotten, uh, the most easiest way, but perhaps also the one we, we hope for performing good in the next years the most, yeah? Well, well thank you. I, I don't think I will do you the favor of ranking my top 10 or the least 10 uh, in Southeastern Europe, but, but certainly, let me start with an anecdote. When I, when I started to work at the Federal Chancellery in 2014, um, a week after, basically, we received Yuri Lianka as the Prime Minister of Moldova. I was very excited. The first sort of official visit that I was preparing for the Chancellor, and 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 everybody was really um, excited about Moldova being in Berlin. And and we had a, a wonderful meeting. And 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 everybody left uh, and and thought, wow, this is really the one country that that will walk ahead of the others. Uh, they had visa liberalization already and everything just looked perfect. There was a good personal chemistry between the, the acting pe people. Now, many things happened since 2014, so I would never even dare to say that these things are irreversible. But what I, what I hear today from Madam Prime Minister, for example, is not only energetic, but it really reflects an attitude uh, which is now for the first time ever, and it was rightly pointed out, not only the president, but also the prime minister and the parliament. So we really have the, the perfect conditions for, for implementing policies which are considered pro-European. Um, and it's really the first time that everything looks as if we could do the reforms, they could do the reforms that they, they really want and that the people want. Um, in any case, the Eastern Partnership has opened its doors to, to all six, and I say deliberately all six partner states, um, but, but there's this new trio, the trio of Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, which is more self-conscious, asking for more in return for more, like the, the concept of more for more, as we call it, implies not only that the integration into the EU and its structures will accelerate, but also that these three countries are ready to invest more, more in reforms, more in, in, in justice, in particular in rule of law, in the fight against corruption, and many other things which are the basis of our cooperation, which is a joint set of values, and this is what we all believe in. That doesn't mean that the other three countries are not part of the Eastern Partnership anymore, but I'm in principle open to, to accelerating the cooperation with these three countries. And there, Moldova certainly is one of the three which has a huge potential of moving faster forward in, into the direction of the EU without mentioning uh, any, any particular goal of, of this movement. Um, 
I find it difficult to compare the Eastern Partnership countries with the, the Western Balkans because they do have a clear European membership perspective from Serbia to, to all the others. Um, well, if one looks at, at different models, and I assume you have discussed Albania as an example of vetting processes um, in, in comparison to Moldova and, and the lessons we learn in Tirana are easily to be applied in, in, in other contexts. And I know for sure that Madam Prime Minister has an advisor who worked before the EU delegation in Tirana. He brings all this knowledge to Chisinau. He can tell exactly what went wrong, what didn't go so well. And, and I think um, these, are, these are elements um, which take Moldova more forward because they, they, they benefit from the experiences that were made elsewhere. So, so in my but view, I have to, to confess that in the panel before, it was not the result that it is easy to access the, what was good and bad in the wedding in Albania. I okay. think it's also a task. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but, but in any case, I think Moldova has the, the, the perfect um, preconditions to, to do in what they want to do. But uh, of course, the circumstances and I haven't mentioned COVID-19, for example, do make it a lot more difficult than, than anybody might, might have hoped it, it would be. And the gas crisis also shows us the regional dimension um, and maybe even the geopolitical dimension that Moldova is, is facing. So actually, I wanted to open up now for the auditorium. The first question will be by me, because you said one thing, you, you remembered uh, to 2014 and when Yuri Lanka came to Berlin. Since then, a lot of things happened. And a lot of things went wrong, Madam uh, Prime Minister, in your country. But I would focus on uh, what you say, what was the biggest mistake perhaps European Union or we, whoever that is exactly, did with Moldova? Were we too, did we trust Plachatniuk too much? Were we too stupid regarding the laundromat and how the money flows is working? Or what would you say, what was our biggest mistake? Were we too hesitant regarding a new perspective or opening the labor markets? What would you say? What was the biggest, what will we do next time better? Which mistake we will not repeat this time? Well, it's a, it's, it's a good question. And I think um, that there were mistakes being made also on, on our side, maybe yes. Um, the role of Mr. Plochotniuk has been seen differently in, in, in some capitals, but um, I think one of the major mistakes was that we didn't go and, and help Moldova to find out what happened to this 1 billion uh, euros after the banking scandal, because this, I think this eroded the trust in, in the system even further to the extent that now you can win elections on justice reforms, which is not the same in Brandenburg, by the way, looking at Knut. So if, if you had such a crisis, and no, no, but, but I think this was one of the, the elements that we didn't, I mean, it's not up to us to, to, to vote in other countries, but, but of course, we, we had to work with the governments that were there, and then we always enjoyed working with everybody. Maybe we could have been more strict. Yes, maybe we could have said more clearly what we expect and how conditionality really works in the Eastern Partnership. But um, I'm, I can assure you that uh, we were strict, but, but it's not always the remedy for, for everything that, that we might not like in, in, in certain countries. But uh, Turning this page, I mean, now we, we do have the association agreement, we do have the DCFTA, let's make full use of its potential and, and, and try to move forward to the extent possible. Mm. Madam Prime Minister, I have a feeling that you want to comment on this. Um, yes, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I actually was working with President Sandu in the Ministry of Education at that time, you know, and uh, we have... Uh, uh, we were excited about education reforms and you know there have been some good things done and indeed i think that uh what 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 was wrong is you know i i, I will give an anecdote myself you know after uh, i got disappointed in hearing the news about the banking fraud um, I actually resigned and left the country. Um, and yes, I participated in the Party of Action and Solidarity, but from the diaspora, from abroad. Um, and and uh, many, many young people who put their hopes at that time uh, were disappointed. And I just think it took way too long. You know, it, it just, um, you know, it, it, I understand a year or two, uh, you know, to for something like this to linger, uh, but it took too long. And, and actually what we need now, and I go um, and speak to all officials and I say, look, um, you know, we need sanctions against these people. We all know who these people are. We don't, we, we can't let them enjoy a European way of life. Uh, you know, and have nice homes 
in southern France or in London um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, take advantage of the money that they have stolen from the Moldovan people. So, and, you know, we, we have to have this political will to actually, um, you know, uh, sort of not let these people now all unite against us and, uh, you know, basically pay trolls, pay disinformation campaigns, control media, and use the money that they have stolen to have a nice life and to work against um, sort of well-intended um, Moldovans. Thank you. So this is the right moment to now open up for questions and comments from the plenary. Kino Fersek, I see. You just have to, to move to a microphone, I think. Um, yeah. This one? Test or one, two, one, two. Sărbăna, doamna prim-ministru, o să vorbesc în limba engleză. So, um, Ms. Prime Minister, I would like to ask you... Please introduce yourself. Yeah, okay. Uh, Keno Verzak, uh, I'm a journalist from Germany and uh, writing for Deutsche Welle. Uh, I have a question on the uh, gas conflict with Russia. So, it, it's already, it has been uh, going on for some weeks. Um, Russia has proven several times in the last 25 years, 25 to 30 years, that it uh, successful managed to blackmail Moldova. Now mm -hmm. all uh, observers basically agree that uh, in September, October, another attempt happened to blackmail Moldova and that it came not uh, accidentally after um, Moldova has a new reform government. Um, you said in your first presentation that um, you tried to have a pragmatic relationship with Russia. Now you have really been pragmatic in the last weeks and have managed uh, to have an agreement, but it turns out that now Russia uh, obviously or apparently tries to blackmail you again. Um, you have this uh, ultimatum to pay debt in 48 hours. So what is your comment on, uh, on the situation? Moldovan government uh, behaving really pragmatic and, and being quite soft uh, in declarations uh, uh, in the relationship towards Russia, Gazprom and so on. And now you have again this uh, yeah, situation. Thank I you. Would, I would propose that we collect perhaps one or two questions more because um, if you want to stick on, on timing, and I think Madam Prime Minister has to be strict at timing in the end, um, then we would have perhaps. Is there anybody else who want to put a point? Please. Yes, hello, my name is Alina Munjo Pivida. I'm a professor at Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. My question is about something which came up in the earlier panel, which is about the fact that it's very difficult to clean corruption, even in a country which is less poor and constrained than Moldova, and especially by means of the judiciary, which itself needs reforming, and it will take years until it really works. So it is rather important in this time to reduce what produces corruption and the issue of Transnistria came up. Moldova never had enough support to, to solve this issue. Is now that we have really a genuine pro-reform government in Moldova, is there going to be more international support? This is a major source of corruption, what, which Transnistria introduces in the, in the Moldovan economy. And it's unrealistic to imagine that whatever reforms we do, we can solve Moldova without tackling this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so I would propose that we start with the second question. And I, as I you heard it in a way, it's a question towards everybody. So I would start with um, international supporters as calling for the European Union, of course. Okay, thank you very much on, on the corruption uh, aspect and uh, Transnistria. Uh, first, on the bigger picture on fighting corruption, uh, it is very important to do it right. There is just one chance to do this. And uh, we have been very much assured uh, by what uh, both the Prime Minister said today and what uh, the Minister of Justice has been saying in the past that uh, the modern government intends to do it right. 
So do it in a due process, uh, set up the parameters for the vetting or and pre-vetting uh, to involve the international partners, Council of Europe, Venice Commission, the European Union. So uh, get to uh, parameters of uh, this uh, vetting that would be completely in line with Moldova's international obligations and that would produce a process that is credible and uh, produces good results. On reducing corruption or, and uh, in the context on Transnistria, I would argue that many things can be done already now. You don't need a settlement to fight smuggling cigarettes. And uh, what we have seen in the news that indeed the there is a, quite a number of uh, interceptions of uh, cigarettes uh, by the Moldovan authorities. Neither there is uh, the aspect of a conflict settlement for having a joint border control with Ukraine. So to step up uh, the cooperation with Ukraine, of course, this is a matter for the interstate relations, but it is doable without the bigger uh, picture, but of course, uh, we are very much interested as supporters of Republic of Moldova that there is solution found to this uh, situation that uh, respects the integrity and territorial sovereignty of Republic of Moldova and provides special status uh, for the region of Transnistria. Uh, but this is uh, for the longer term and uh, in the context of fighting corruption, I, I would argue that it is very much possible to do it already now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Littenberg, what do you think about that? I mean, also from your experience with uh, other frozen conflicts or not so frozen conflicts in the region, um, do you think that for a reform government, it is the right way to um, try to solve this? Or is it more a bit like uh, Vashe in Nashe, uh, yours and ours. Uh, so that's perhaps the reason why Moldova is not strict towards Russia in the moment. Well, well, first of all, of course, it's up to, to the government to set its own priorities. And I understand from the campaign and, and everything that um, they, they were looking very much at the country itself, at uh, domestic reforms, at the economic situation, and, and trying to, to, to push this agenda does not exclude looking at the, the, the conflict in, and around Transnistria. But of course, it's not, in my view, the, the top priority of this government, which is even understandable looking at, at what was the situation that they found in, in Chisinau these days. However, we think that um, Transnistria should be part of the agenda, and I think it is actually part of the agenda. Now the colleagues in the OECE were offering a number of, of uh, meetings and gatherings. It hasn't um, happened yet, but, but I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, early next year we will continue working on a, on a long-term solution for this conflict. It's uh, one of the protected conflicts which are really causing when economic downsides and and, and and problems for for both sides here and then i think it would be in the interest of everybody to find an agreed solution this will not be easy but um certainly it's not up to to moldova to to voice some demands towards moscow and and tell them what to do i think it's very good that moldova has chosen this pragmatic approach and that um, they they try to 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 find agreements on the most pressing issues and and the others will follow with the support of of the oce the eu of germany and everybody uh, else who considers himself an in, in interested um, party in into these five plus two talks this is something where we can be helpful also in contact with the regional actors um, looking at Ukraine in particular, but but also others. Mm -hmm. Madam Prime Minister, would you say that uh, the unsolved Transnistria point is a problem for fight against corruption as well? Uh, and perhaps also, do you think that it's only uh, the Russians always the problem or could other partners in the region also be more helpful perhaps uh, for the path of your government, but also specifically regarding uh, the process regarding uh, Transnistria? Um, thank you. First of all, uh, uh, let me th uh, thank the distinguished uh, uh, participants who asked the question. I actually uh, have met uh, Ms. Munju Pipidi in a 
previous life, uh, I hope she remembers, and I have read her uh, work on corruption. So, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, Transnistria is uh, not the only source of corruption, right? So it's an important source of corruption, but it's not the only source. And actually, you know, prioritizing and tackling uh, corruption within Moldova will actually make us much stronger uh, in terms of our negotiating position. So, you know, uh, uh, strengthening uh, institutions in Moldova, uh, uh, you know, removing this corrupt uh, invested interests uh, that have existed in sort of the, the exchanges uh, between the right bank and the left bank uh, will actually uh, ultimately make us stronger to help um, you know, resolve the, the, the Transnistrian conflict. Uh, so, so we see this as a sort of iterative um, process, uh, you know, uh, concentrate on uh, what we can do here, what we can do with international partners. Uh, very importantly, you know, we can uh, better control our borders. So uh, to, the, to Manuel's question, you know, we, uh, do uh, continue working to uh, talking to Ukraine about joint border control along the uh, uh, sort of Transnistrian uh, portion of the uh, Moldovan Ukrainian border. Um, you know, we can improve uh, regulations uh, and, and sort of better control our imports and what goes to Transnistria. I mean, there are a number of things that we could do. Uh, and you know, we should concentrate on we can, what, what we can do and become stronger to do more. Um, and, and here, you know, I will actually circle back to the very first thing that um, uh, uh, Ambassador Mazek said about, you know, putting the right people in place, strengthening institutions in Moldova, in the central government, and then, um, you know, becoming more and more sophisticated in our uh, policy and decision making. Um, I think a country like Moldova, and if we talk about sort of pragmatic foreign policy, you know, we shouldn't be talking about uh, blackmail or countries that create us problems. You know, I will leave to experts, civil society organizations to make such judgments. You know, I, I do think we should um, continue our uh, uh, you know, uh, pragmatic policy, as I said, you know, we have complex issues, we recognize them, but we have to engage, we have to talk, we have to uh, sort of create these um, um, opportunities uh, for uh, exchanges, uh, even if they don't immediately lead to uh, certain results, you know, we need to understand better. Um, and uh, so, so, uh, you know, I, I am very hopeful that this 48-hour uh, 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 deadline is just a glitch that will be uh, easily overcome. Was the answer on Kino Pesek's question uh, as well? So there's still 10 minutes to go. Yeah, Stefan Meister, please. It's working. Yeah. Okay, Stefan Meister, German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I have a question to Matthias Lüttenberg. Um, you mentioned the trio um, and also the potential of the trio. Um, I just want to ask you, do you think there will be more recognition from the EU side um, and from the member state side on, on the trio and the importance of the trio? And where do you see the main, the main uh, opportunities uh, and maybe also the deficits at the moment in, in the cooperation, but where's, where's the real potential of this, um, of this trio also having in mind the limited interest um, of the EU for new members um, uh, yeah, in, in, in future and, and the limited ambitions also with regard uh, to the Eastern Partnership countries? <laughs> Yeah, 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 again, thank you. It's good to have a colleague who can, the moderator is not checking. Thanks. Perhaps you need more time for thinking about the answer. It's, uh, yeah, yeah I, I just, <laughs> I'd be very brief. So uh, thank you very much. My name is Elia Biscotti. I'm a researcher at the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies in Regensburg. I will 
go back to the Transnistrian question because it concerns my research particularly. And because uh, in the next weeks we will have uh, on the left bank of quotation marks the next, uh, so to say, presidential elections. And I was wondering which, uh, uh, what is the outlook, especially asking uh, uh, Madam Prime Minister, um, in uh, how it can uh, basically affect uh, after the, the new uh, forces came in force, uh, came in power in Moldova, what, uh, how will this change the relations between the two banks, uh, especially considering that uh, uh, this uh, uh, electoral round on the left bank seems particularly uh, favoring uh, a further um, uh, establishment of the um, current uh, uh, forces uh, in power there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my proposal is now that we link this to a question with uh, the concluding question, which I would put, and uh, then everybody has the chance to like sum it up, and then uh, outside there will be food. Madam Prime Minister, unfortunately, we cannot send the food via Zoom to you, but of course we invite you the next time uh, to have some meal with us. Um, so my question uh, is to all three as a concluding question on the end. In the moment they're taking the negotiations between the three uh, traffic light coalition, the possible coalition partners in Berlin, and uh, nobody of you is uh, really uh, inside this. I have been a bit inside and everybody there is only waiting for my SMS tonight, what Moldova and what Mr. Lüttenberg <laughs> and what Mr. Mazak wants from the uh, new German government to be done in favor of Moldova. And I will immediately submit it. So it's the chance for you three <laughs> to say what should be uh, the new input of the new German government in favor of uh, Moldova. I will not tell to anybody from where the source is. <laughs> I will put it all in my credits, of course. Um, yeah, this is uh, my proposal for the concluding question. And now, uh, Madam Prime Minister, you want to start perhaps? Sure. Um, so in terms of the... Um, uh, outlook for the Transnistrian region following the elections. You know, I'm a development specialist. Uh, I, I call myself a neo-institutionalist. Uh, so I, uh, uh, you know, I believe the underlying fundamentals have not changed uh, for the new, for the elections to bring something new. At the same time, um, you know, uh, as with uh, the country that exercises effective control over uh, the Transnistrian region, uh, you know, the policies can be unpredictable. So, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a difficult question to answer. So, on one hand, you know, uh, uh, I don't see uh, all things being equal. Any change, on the other hand, you know, this all things being equal can always change. Uh, so um, this is why it's actually very difficult to uh, come up with a policy or uh, negotiate, but I'm sure you know that if you research the area. And then um, uh, in terms of um, Manuel's question, uh, I'm not sure this was directed to me or not, but, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, we we will be uh, welcoming um, uh, representatives of the government at the end of uh, November, um, and uh, you know we'll be expressing sort of our um, priorities, and we will be talking about funding. Uh, but of course, you know beyond sort of development assistance and funding, and you know the areas that we want investment in, let's say infrastructure or. Um, uh, local development and uh, local projects and, uh, you know, helping us with the uh, human resource problem and helping us with the diaspora. Beyond this, you know, I always try to think, well, what we can do as a society, it's not just about the government. If we want a truly sustainable ch change, it's not just about what the government does. You know, it's very important um, to uh, continue uh, attracting investors in. You know, we have uh, important German investors, uh, especially in the 
free economic zone. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, German investments in Romania that uh, may want to cross the river um, and and uh, uh, sort of uh, create new jobs, bring a new sort of know-how and productivity, as I said. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, also uh, this uh, political support uh, uh, is very important and, and, and the support uh, sort of more broadly in terms of, uh, you know, people-to-people -people contacts, support to civil society, um, and uh, just um, uh, sort of broader engagements beyond the development assistance to the government. Thank you so much. And at this point already, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and uh, yeah, being tonight with us. It was a great pleasure to have you here on the screen. And we hope that when the pandemic is over, um, we will also meet you in a person in Kisinau, but also in Berlin. Um, uh, Mr. Lüttenberg, perhaps I will give the last word as always to the last instance, the European Union, yes? <laughs> I'm with Stefan Meister's question on the Eastern Partnership, the trio, its potential, its possible downsides. I, I tend to see the, the benefits in the first place because first of all, I think it's important that three out of the six Eastern partners agree that they wanted to achieve more. And, and this creates a certain sense of competitiveness in a, in a good sense. I think they, they would hopefully not be too demanding and the expectations not being too high because as Stefan Meister rightly um, pointed out, the EU is not necessarily open for more members, but I think the EU is open for improving their relationship with the Eastern partners. And the example of Belarus shows everybody very clearly that it's not a foregone conclusion that these countries will uh, get ever closer to the EU, but they might also be the other way around. And therefore, we should not miss the opportunity to at least cooperate to the extent possible with those who want to do this. This does not mean necessarily that the end is membership. And I'm, I'm, I'm always cautious to, to, to use the term European perspective in the context of these um, the three countries. But this is something that needs to be explained. And it, I think it can be explained. And I know that President Sandro, for example, is very good at, at explaining that to its own people. It's, it's more about how can we prepare ourselves to become a modern pro-European country with rule of law and everything else. And this is where the EU and its conditionality and its support programs, the association agreement can, can be of help. And I'm, I'm optimistic that the, the TRIO approach will, will help accelerating these, these efforts also in, in the three countries, but also raise more awareness. And the, the Eastern Partnership Summit um, next month will hopefully then um, be a strong sign into this direction. Um, this leads me to, to your question. And, and of course, um, we are already do have a full-fledged Moldova policy. And so my wish to the new government would be that they will, um, first of all, understand that Moldova is a European country which is on a good path and then which it needs a critical friend. But um, I'm, I'm honestly quite optimistic knowing that uh, the, the government negotiations that we will have uh, later this week on, on the development cooperation will lead to a considerable sum of, 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 of support and that we will grant to, to the country. So we are already now implementing um, um, the policy of support. And um, I think it's more a matter of, of the mindset Do we really care about the countries east of, of the European Union's borders, or do we just um, tend to, to step away because others already claim that they're interesting for them? I hope this will not be the case. Do you think that a little bit a sniff more optimism regarding the ideology of future possible membership, openness to the wish of those countries could be a nice signal if this happened? <laughs> It, it could be a nice signal, but it has to be serious. And, and if, if we cannot, as the EU, give this signal today, then we should not do it. Otherwise, we'll only create expectations, which would then be disappointed. And uh, again, looking at the Western Balkans, we, we know that even the promise of 2003 of Thessaloniki has not led to, to the membership of the six Western Balkan countries. And quite frankly, we are still far away from that. So why should we then dangle with a carrot that we might not even be able to deliver on, even if we wanted to as Germany, because we still need 26 others to, to agree as well. I know that an EU ambassador will never comment on questions where the council is not anemonious. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, there are questions also for you to sum up, Mr. Okay. 
Okay, I think this is a rather difficult subject to sum up uh, because the questions are rather diverse. Uh, perhaps I would start with a trio question, and I don't think that recognition is an issue. We recognize the trio as a format, uh, and this fits perfectly well with the concept of more for more. So there are three countries that are willing to do more. Uh, we are uh, ready to engage with them on how to engage with them more. What we would like to see is that uh, we don't create something artificial and uh, that this is uh, part of the Eastern Partnership Framework as a broad framework. Which brings me to the second point, which is that if I have to choose between uh, slogans and pragmatic work, I would choose the pragmatic work. So, in other words, there's plenty of things that we can do with the Republic of Moldova that will bring uh, the country closer to Europe without getting into some discussion on uh, what might be at the end of the road many years from now. We are at the beginning of the road. And uh, finally, on the German uh, question, it is all equally difficult for me to discuss member states, uh, but I think one thing I can say rather safely, and it might be a bit boring answer, but I think that Germany has been really a very good European citizen when it comes to the Republic of Moldova. You have had a very strong engagement with the Republic of Moldova when it comes to cooperation. You have had very strong uh, support for the Republic of Moldova when it comes to political support. So all we can wish for is continuation of this uh, engagement and hopefully expanding it in the future. Thank you. And Mr. Mazak, I can also say from our side, it was a pleasure to have you here on the screen, Paldis. And uh, yeah, see you next time, perhaps also in Berlin uh, or in Kisinau. And thank you for your uh, taking part. And of course, Mr. Lüttenberg, also vielen Dank um, to your uh, um, uh, um, participation here, and you are also you are invited for some food afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you want, uh, yes. Um, just one technical remark: we didn't have a screen here, so I couldn't use questions from the chat. Uh, nobody should think that um, this was due to some other reasons. I just had no chance to read them. And yeah, thank you. And I hope that this uh, evening was a um, good motivation for being tomorrow on time and listening to the coming up panels on our Tomorrow Days conference. And now, guten Appetit und einen schönen Abend und vielen Dank.